the sound, you know? Good morning, church. Happy Mother's Day. I know I'm very thankful for my mom. And um, also there's uh, a lot of people in my life who have been a spiritual mom to me. And uh, we also, even if we're not a mom ourselves, I know that God has given me a heart for many people around me. And so we're just thankful for that. And we're thankful that God has a tender heart towards us. Hallelujah. Well, let's welcome, let's welcome the Holy Spirit and praise the Lord together in spirit and in truth.
us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand against? Our God is great. Sorry, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God. One more time. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any You are higher. Our God is healer, awesome in power.
Create. 
to the promises of God in Scripture. And one of the promises that, that the Lord has just been kind of impressing upon me lately is Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for the good of those who love Christ and who are called to his purpose. That means that we, w without having to do anything, we walk in God's favor everywhere we go. There's an upgrade, there's a blessing, there's something that the Lord is doing in all of our circumstances that is going to bless us and minister to us, that is going to help grow us for our benefit. Now the truth is, is that we don't always see that. In fact, that's, it's, it's very difficult to see the blessing in the midst of a challenge, in the midst of a difficulty. It's very difficult to see the upgrade when we're going through the ringer. But I'm here to tell you, there is an upgrade. There is a blessing tied to the end of the struggle. Whatever it is that you're going through, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you His perspective. Holy Spirit lenses so that you can begin to ask and see what the benefit is going to be. What is the blessing? And it may not be revealed right away. The Lord was speaking to me about something that, like for me, just yesterday, that I'm like, Lord, why is this a challenge? Why is this such a struggle? And he says, I'm building in you something that can only be built through this challenge. Sometimes that's the blessing. And I won't know what it is until I step out at the other end of the challenge. So hold fast onto the promises of God. Whatever it is that our challenge is, Hold fast to the promise of God because I believe, I promise you, God promises you that it will be for your benefit and for his glory. Amen? Amen. So Holy Spirit, we're here today and we're asking that you would give all of us supernatural Holy Spirit glasses. Supernatural Holy Spirit glasses so that we can receive what it is that you want us to receive today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm looking around at, at the, the people that I normally have to do the announcements slash offering, and I'm not seeing them. And, and partly because we don't really have announcements anymore. They're supposed to be on that back TV. We're having a little technical difficulty. If you want our weekly announcements, um, I just go to our website for this week. Hopefully next week we will have worked out. It is working? Okay, well then the technical difficulty is... No longer a difficulty. <laughs> um, so if you're visiting uh, with us, just so you know, we, we uh, like to hand out Connect cards when people first walk in the door. Hopefully you got one. And I would encourage you to fill that out. Let us know you're visiting with us. Uh, let us know any prayer requests that you have or any praise reports that you have. Uh, we really do get those on Monday or Tuesday. And as a leadership team, we pray over them. And we've seen some, some you know, pretty amazing miracles through that. And so for the rest of, uh, and then put those in the offering basket or you can put them in the offering box as we, as we have our deacons uh, pass those out and collect that. But now we're going to pray for the offering. I want to remind you guys um, of a couple of things. Uh, we are still raising money and it's going to be kind of an ongoing thing for building renovations. In fact, you're going to see that on our new printed offering uh, envelope. It's going to actually say building updates or building renovations. So uh, please consider giving into that so that we can, you know, continue to, to work on making the front of the building 
uh, sharp. How many of you guys like what's, what's happening up there so far? It's looking pretty sharp, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so, and, you, and we all have an opportunity to sow into that. So uh, we appreciate anything that you can give uh, into, that, into that ministry. So let's just pray and, and uh, just bless our offering. Holy Spirit, we, we live to serve you and to glorify you. And more than anything, Lord, we want to just partner with you in building the kingdom, not only in our lives, but in our families' lives, in the lives of the people around us, but as a church family. We want to build your kingdom. And it is the greatest honor to be able to do that, whether we're donating our time or our gifts uh, or even our finances, Lord. And so we ask that you would take this offering and that you would use it wholeheartedly, fully for your kingdom and that you would bless those who are investing into it. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple things. Uh, that I was, uh, and we are going to be doing some announcements, okay? The only thing that's going on that back TV are things that are going to be regular things that happen every week or every month. We're just trying to eliminate some of that stuff. But here's a couple of things that, that don't happen every week or every, or every, every month. Um, first thing is, is I believe that we are having a bake sale. I want to say... Um, uh, next Sunday, somebody told me next Sunday. I don't have it in my email. So next Sunday, we're having a bake sale to raise money for the Back to School Bash. Um, Amy, it looks like she's back there standing up, waving to everyone. She's spearheading that. So if you want to bake something, uh, and uh, please don't don't buy anything and donate it to a bake sale. Don't do that. No, no, no. Bake something. And donate it to the bake sale. That's it. Yes. Uh, oh. <laughs> George says Corbos. You can only buy Corbos and donate it to the bake sale, apparently. <laughs> that's, in little, that's in Little Italy, right? Yeah, so you have quite the haul. Um, <laughs> but if you want to donate into the bake sale, uh, then uh, please see Amy. She'll help coordinate that. And if you are hungry, uh, come hungry next week and you can buy some good stuff. The other thing that I want to just remind people before we dismiss the kids is that today is our um, prophetic rooms. So if you haven't already signed up, if you're interested, uh, we believe in the gift of prophecy here. And uh, our very own Dale Moyer is leading a team of people to minister to you and to give you a word from the Lord. Uh, sign up for that. Um, we do them about every other week. And um, it's been a really rich time. If you want to hear a word from the Lord and then take that recorded word, because we do ask that you record it, and then pray into it, um, I really believe that you'll be blessed. So without further ado, I believe that's the only, the only other thing. Uh, I'm going to just dismiss the kids. So if you're visiting with us, please stand up and greet somebody. And if you're not visiting with us, you've been here a while, then stand up and greet the other people. Exchange numbers and take them out to lunch. Not today, that's for your mom, next week.
mean, that's true with like any instrument. It seems like if you start when you're younger, you know, but you can't learn. No. <laughs> Don't give up. Yeah. I'm going to head back there. Good morning, everyone. You can find your seats. I had a good joke to share, and uh, one of our pastors and, and uh, his wife advised against it. So if you want to hear a good joke, come up after the service and I'll share it with you. <laughs> There's wisdom in a multitude of counsel, they say. I read that in a book somewhere. Well, if you could find your seats. Hope everyone's had a chance to look at the announcement screen in the, in the back, in the foyer. Um, next week or the week after, I'm hoping to put up there uh, an advertisement or, or uh, an announcement for our vineyard conference. Our annual vineyard conference is going to be uh, in Cincinnati this year. Uh, they're, they're breaking it up into two conferences, an east and a west, since this is like the 50th anniversary of vineyard. And uh, the close one is going to be in Cincinnati, so it's not going to be too far away. Uh, I, I'm going to be there. Uh, it's not. It's during the week, so I'm not going to miss a Sunday. But I would encourage anybody who's able to go to attend. Now, it, I was thinking about Cincinnati. How many of you guys know where the name, the city Cincinnati, gets its name? Oh, who said that? Yeah, there's a Roman statesman named Cincinnatus. Yeah, how many of you guys? Do you, does anyone know the story of Cincinnatus? It's a very fascinating story. You guys come here for a sermon and you get a history lesson, almost always about ancient Rome. So the legend goes that Cincinnati, he was a Roman senator, and when he, when he retired, he left Rome and he went, and rather than chasing power for himself and his family, he left Rome and began to work on his family farm. Just a few years later, however, in 458 BC, a neighboring city revolted against Rome, broke their treaty, and after two councils, these are sort of like the, the presidents or the war generals, after two councils were defeated in battle, in a panic, the Senate sent, they left Rome and they sent for Cincinnatus, where they found him on his farm plowing his field. And they immediately recalled him to Rome, where he was promptly elected full dictator for a period of six months. Now, this was like unheard of during the Roman Republic. Full dictator meant that you had absolute authority. You were a king, you were an emperor, and they hated, they despised kings. But they gave him full power. However, after just 15 days, he was able to fully defeat the enemy, and upon returning to Rome, he gave back all of his power and went back to his farm. Astonishingly, about 20 years later, when another plot was discovered to overthrow Rome, this time in the city, the Senate again went to Cincinnati, found him in his old age, about 65, 70 years old, and they begged him to return to Rome, where they promptly elected him another 
dictatorship, another six-month dictatorship, absolutely unprecedented. But again, after just 21 days, he squashed the rebellion and gave up all of his power and simply returned to his farm where he died in relative obscurity in 430 BC. Now I share this story first of all because history is cool and I like it, it's interesting. We need to know our history. It's actually really important that we know our history. Um, but also because what ended up happening after just a couple hundred years of this legend was that Cincinnatus eventually began to be somebody who was laughed at and mocked because he didn't pursue political power. See, in Rome, they eventually dissolved the Senate. They created an environment in which they believed the best possible life, the best, the flourishing life, the best possible life was focused on gaining financial, political power, and prestige. And as we'll see today, this is the exact opposite of what Christ says the best possible life is. I hope you did your homework because there's a lot to cover today. Let's pray. Lord, we give you this service. You've highlighted uh, for, for me and for so many of us that you are trying to massage into us the ability to see the world from your perspective, the ability to put on kingdom lenses and see things from your perspective. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us that supernatural ability to be able to read your word and see it from a heavenly kingdom perspective. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, for those who weren't here last week, we're beginning to dive into a series that I'm calling the Sermon on the Mount, but it's the Luke edition. Sermon on the Mount, Luke edition. edition which is a little different than Matthew's gospel. I believe that they are talking about, both Matthew and Luke are writing about the same series of teachings. I sort of made my case for why I don't think the Sermon on the Mount is one specific event last week. I would encourage you to listen to that on podcast. But we're going to begin by picking up the, the uh, uh, dialogue or the scripture in Luke chapter 6. Verse 20 through and 21. Looking at his disciples, he said, blessed. I'm just going to stop there. Blessed. I could really spend the entire time just talking about that one word. Because the entire Sermon on the Mount hinges on an understanding of this one word. He finishes, he says, Blessed you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Then Matthew 5, 3 puts it a little different. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I would submit that these two phrases, poor in spirit and poor, are identical in meaning. Same with kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. But I'm going to jump ahead to verse 22 because what, what Luke does is something a little bit different than Matthew. Matthew has nine of these blessing statements and Luke only has four. And Matthew sort of clumps his together in, in sort of passages of three. So there's three of them that are really saying or getting at a, a very particular thing and then there's three more and then there's three more. But Luke does something different. He identifies four of them which are, again, are sort of mirrored in Matthew's gospel. But then he says sort of an inverse. Okay, so he says, blessed are those who are poor, and then he gives three more. And then in verse 24, he says, but woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. But we need to talk about the word blessing, okay? So this is super complicated, and I'm really going to do my absolute best to try to simplify it, okay? We're going to define blessing. But basically what happened, Jesus likely spoke this in Aramaic. It was written down maybe in Hebrew, but definitely in Greek. 
Then it was translated into sort of an old Roman, then a new Roman, then an old English, and a new English, and finally we have our own translations. And then they went back, so they did all those translations over a period of 2,000 years, and then they went back and they said, no, we're going to take our current English and we're going to actually translate it into Greek, or sorry, we're going to take the Greek and translate it into English, right? But over the last 2,000 years, this word blessed has taken on a religious meaning in English. And many people have sort of lost the flavor of what it really means, what Jesus is really talking about in this message. So let's just begin by sort of defining. The word here in Greek is makarios, okay? The word here in Greek is makarios. Oh, there it is. In Hebrew, though, there's two different words that mean blessed. So when they translated the Hebrew into Greek, they didn't translate them as two different words. So you have the word barak or baruch or barak. I couldn't figure out exactly how it's pronounced, which means this is the word that is commonly found in the Old Testament that is translated as blessed. But then you have ashrei. This is pronounced ashrei. It means happiness or blessedness. Now, the difference between these words is actually very, very important because one is a verb and one is an adjective. One is, is something that is happening. Either the Lord is blessing somebody or the, the, maybe it's also used in the context where somebody is blessing the Lord, maybe in prayer or in a psalm. And the other one is a, is a description of somebody who could be blessed or who might be blessed, okay? Now, I'm going to give you guys a quiz. You guys, I know a lot of you guys did your homework. I'm proud of you. I appreciate that. I'm going to give you guys a quiz with this word, okay? I want you to tell me, I'm going to read some scriptures, and I want you to tell me if this is the word Baruch, okay, a verb, or if it's Ashrei, okay? So let's read... Read, uh, oh boy, my PowerPoint's all messed up. There it is, Genesis. You guys, nobody even said anything, huh? All right. <laughs> so God created man, this is chapter 1, verse 27. God created mankind in his own image, and the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. God blessed man, them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Baruch or Ashrei? I heard Baruch. Yeah. This is something that's happening. This is a verb. God blessed them. Okay? Let's go to Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Baruch or Ashrei? Yeah, Ashrei. Yeah, because this is, this is wisdom literature. And this is what you really have to understand about how to interpret what Jesus is saying. Jesus, during his time, he was not the only one who spoke this way, okay? So obviously you see it in the Old Testament. You see this kind of language, blessed is he or blessed is the one who does this. It's describing the good life. It's describing somebody who is flourishing. It's describing the best possible outcome. Blessed is the one who does such and such. Now, there were many other authors, authors, Jewish uh, authors and leaders who, rabbis, who would write about this. And I want to give you a few examples of the kinds of things that they would write so that you can kind of understand a little bit about what this word means and you can understand what would have been heard by Jesus' audience during this time. So one author, he wrote 200 years before the time of Jesus, and it's called The Wisdom of Ben Shura. He describes 10 ways in which a person is ashrei, blessed, living the good life. Now, some of them are, uh, are like make sense. People wouldn't dispute them. So, for example, ashrei is the one who rejoices in his children. Right? Nobody would dispute this. How about this one? 
Ashray is the man who lives with a reasonable wife. That's what he wrote. I'm Ashray. I hope you are. That's what he wrote. <laughs> But then he goes, and he's, just, he's already sort of walking a fine line, right? You can tell, like, who's his audience? Then he writes, Ashray is the one who lives to see the downfall of his enemies. Hmm. Boy, Jesus, that doesn't sound like the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus says to love our enemies. But this is the kind of thing that the Jewish audience would have, audiences would have been exposed to. Then he says, Ashray is the one who never has to serve an inferior. Hmm. Boy, Jesus says that we should, we sh if somebody asks us to carry their baggage for one mile, we carry it for two. Sounds a little different, right? How about the Essenes? Anyone remember who the Essenes were? The Essenes, they wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, they were a, a, a sect of Judaism that believed that the Pharisees and the people, the religious leaders, were sort of leading the people astray. So they went and they lived up in the mountains and they had their own high priest and all this stuff. And they also wrote things. So if, one is, Ashrei are those who rejoice in wisdom, who do not have outbursts of foolishness. Yeah, that makes sense. How about this one? And this is, you can kind of see that it's the Essenes here. Ashray are the ones who adhere to the laws of the Torah and do not adhere to the distorted paths. So we've been talking about the last month or so about how the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they had like, they had the Torah, which was the, the, the law, you know, from the Old Testament, and then they had all of these extra rules and laws and regulations to follow. And so the Essenes are saying, blessed are those who follow the Torah, but not all that extra stuff. Are you starting to get a picture of what this word means? He's talking about, it's not just blessed. What they're really saying is a flourishing life, okay? Somebody who's living to their full potential, the full manifestation of what it means to be human are these things, right? And so they give descriptors. And this is, this is not an easy word to define, but if you get it, this is why I'm giving so many different examples. By the way, this word ashray is used 45 times in the Old Testament. You know, it's used, it's used in one instance to describe the Queen of Sheba comes into Solomon's courts. And what does she say? She doesn't say that Solomon is ashray. She says, ashray are those who get to sit in this court and listen to the wisdom of Solomon. So it's, it's describing more than just a blessing. It's describing a content, good life. Okay, so this is, this is where we pick up with Jesus, right? The Beatitudes, or in this case, the, the, the writings here in Luke, they're markers and plumb lines that people have in life and society that position them for the best possible life. And this is where it gets interesting, because... All of the things that these people thought were the good life, a flourishing life, are the exact opposite of what Jesus starts to talk about right off from the bat. So let's look at the word poor or poor in spirit. Okay, it's poor in spirit in Matthew or poor in, in Luke. Most people look at this phrase and it kind of feels like Jesus is saying is, is that these are people that are humble or meek, right? But that's not actually what he's saying. And without boring you too much, getting into the Greek, I could spend another 10 minutes. I mean, we, 15 minutes into the message, I got through one word. Blessed. I hope you got it. Ashray. You understand? It's the good life. Poor in spirit. Basically, Jesus is referring to the life vitality of the people. So it's, it's more of what gives people a feeling of power and self-autonomy, self-direction, control over their life. This is a value that in America we, we hold very dear, and really probably in the West, right? You know, the, this sort of self-autonomy, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, being able to control the outcome of your life, right? Personal responsibility. So, but, but Jesus, Jesus says this is actually kind of a bad thing. So a good commentary, a good interpretation of this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of give my 
commentary on this, on just the first sentence. The best possible life, a flourishing life, belongs to those who are powerless to control the direction of your life. That's what Jesus is saying. Let me say that again. The best possible life, the flourishing life, belongs to those who are powerless to control the direction of their life. What is he talking about? You've got to be in the, like, the audience like Jesus. His disciples are like, he's gone off the rails again. What's he talking about? He can heal people. I know he's a prophet. He does all these miracles, but this is not what I thought he was going to say the good life is. It sounds like nonsense, at least to us. But keep in mind his audience. Who are the people around him? These are people from all over Galilee who have absolutely no control over their own lives. The Romans have complete political governmental power. The Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law have complete monopoly on accessing God and all matters spiritual. The only way you can access any of that stuff is by paying money. They don't own land. They're basically slaves to the Romans if they're asked to do something. And they're born into a situation which they have no power to control their own destiny. And Jesus says, Ashrei belongs to the powerless. And then he flips it even more and says, for yours is the kingdom of God. That's the blessing. That's the Baruch. So Ashrei are those who are powerless. Baruch, because they will get the kingdom of God. The blessing is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God in this case is basically the message that Jesus came to bring. It's the gospel. It's the relationship with God that is offered through Jesus Christ. It's sort of like this upside-down kingdom that he's describing. But just let me unpack it a little bit more. I, I promise it'll make sense. I, I hope that it'll make sense. Let me just... Before a person is even open to the idea to receive the gospel, what needs to happen? They need to recognize their need for a savior. For most people, they have to be placed in a position in which they have no power and no control over the direction or the outcome of their lives. In AA, they call it the rock bottom. Somebody has to get to a place where they recognize their rock bottom, that they are completely powerless, powerless, by the way, for those of you guys who don't know, the program of AA was written by two Christians, and every day when they wrote, when they were, they took them about nine months to write this program, the 12 Steps, every day they read the Sermon on the Mount and the book of James, every day. And what they did is, is they interwove these teachings into the 12 Steps. That's why it's the first step. It's the first beatitude. It's the first step. You have to get to a place where you're powerless over the outcome of your lives. Usually this happens during a crisis, a trauma, or a medical problem that you just can't control. Who, wh man's power isn't going to work. The, med the doctors are saying you have 5% chance to live, and we're going to do the best we can. Where's your faith? You, 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 have, you cannot depend on worldly human needs. Jesus is saying, do you get what he's saying here? When people are put in the position in which their very life depends on God, Jesus says that these people are not only ashray, but they are positioned to receive the blessing of the kingdom of God. The Baruch. The Baruch. <laughs> yeah. This, this line is foundational in even being able to receive salvation. If you walk through life with nothing to challenge you, if you have money, if you have power, if you have wealth, and you never get to experience this powerlessness, the likelihood that these people will ever experience the most valuable and beautiful life in all of creation is nil. It's not zero. Jesus isn't making a, a rule here that, that rich people can't get into heaven. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying that their chances are less than average. Their chances diminish significantly to be able to receive the kingdom of God. 
Mark records in, in, uh, in his gospel in, in chapter 10. Listen to what Jesus says about the rich. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Okay, so by the way, this is, this is a story. There's a very rich man. I should give some context. There's a very rich man who comes to Jesus and says, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? I followed all the rules, all the stuff in the Torah. I've done everything that I possibly can. What can I do? And Jesus says to him, the one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. <laughs> what does the man do? Just walks away. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words because Jesus said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Not impossible. Very difficult. Because they're not poor in spirit. These people don't need a savior in their eyes. And what does Jesus say about them? This just breaks my heart. He says, woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe here is an exclamation of extreme grief. You know, in other places where Jesus uses this, he's using kind of aggressive language, like in the Olivet Discourse and Matthew and all this stuff where he's talking about the, the Pharisees and calling them hypocrites. Woe to you who are, you know, teachers in religious law. It's, this is different here. It's the same word, but it's a different context. Here, it's, it's extreme sorrow and sadness. It's grief. I, 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 I literally visualize Jesus like crying when he's saying this because he loves the rich. He loves these people. He wants them to repent. He wants to teach them what it means to be ashray, to have the good life. But they're so rich, they don't even see it. You've already received your comfort. And rich here, by the way, is not limited to financial wealth. It is, of course, but it, it also includes things, basically anything that people put their trust in other than God. So it includes power, their career, prestige, anything that makes them feel that they don't need God. It's their false sense of identity, unhealthy relationship. Jesus is crying out and saying, woe to those who are so distracted by the world that they think they don't need me for they're missing out on real wealth, kingdom wealth. This is, he's introducing throughout this whole, and this is what we're going to be talking about for the next like six weeks. He's introducing the upside down kingdom where the things that people think that they want that are valuable, that are important, Jesus is saying that's, it's all rubbish. These are the things of the kingdom. These are the things. Now you have to understand because we live in a, in a, in a generation 2,000 years later of people who have, who have studied this and who have sort of interwoven it into Western culture. We look at these things and, and they may seem a little backwards, but we understand them for the most part. To Jesus' time and Jesus, the people in his audience, this is like baffling. What are you talking about? We're poor. We're scratching a living. We can barely feed ourselves. And Jesus is saying, "Is you are the ones who are going to be able to inherit the kingdom, not these people." He's flipping the script on what it means. He's flipping the script on what it means to be wealthy and to have the good life, to be flourishing. He says that those who are in a position to need God, they're the rich ones. They will receive real wealth, kingdom wealth. This is the message of the gospel. Many of you guys have heard me say, I grew up with worldly wealth. I, I grew up in a, j just a huge house. I had my own little apartment by the time I was like 11 years old. And, and there's five of us living in the house and we never interacted with each other. Listen, we were dirt poor. 
We had no real relationships. We were not connected with one another. Then I meet the Kumises, and there's 12 people living in a home. It was a little bit, maybe a little bit bigger than the little apartment that I had in my mansion. And they're the most wealthy people I've ever met in my life. Listen, if you're poor in spirit, it means that you need God and you know it. And you are ashray. This is foundational not only to receiving Christ, but in also living a flourishing life. It means that you're able to let go of anxiety and worry because you can trust in God for your circumstance. It means that you're not easily shaken by the world, the things you see around you. If you watch, still watch the news, which I hope you don't, when you hear about things, you're not still shaken because you know that the world can only do so much to you. It means you live in peace and confidence in knowing and being confident in your place in God's eyes and your place in His kingdom. This is the good life, guys. This is our blessing this, to be able to see this with spiritual eyes, heavenly eyes, and to be able to receive God's kingdom, this is for people who realize they need a Savior. I know that most people in here realize that. Most, most of you are Christians. You realize that you need a Savior. But I actually think that there's people in here who don't. They don't realize they need a Savior yet. Things are going too well in their life. Maybe they stumbled in here because it's Mother's Day and they thought that they were going to do something nice for their mom. And if you're here today and you've never really admitted to yourself in your own heart that you're in need of a Savior, here's what I want to tell you. The elevator's going down and you can get off anywhere you like. If you still don't think that you need a Savior, if you still don't think that you need Jesus, the elevator's going down. But you have the decision to get off anywhere you like and to receive the free gift of salvation, to receive this kingdom of God that Jesus is talking about. And if you have the courage, if you have the courage to come up for prayer at the end of the service, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to light off fireworks. This person just received Jesus. That's up in heaven. That's happening in heaven when people receive Jesus. I'm not going to embarrass you down here, but I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to get you discipled and baptized. And we're going we're to see if we can get the kingdom in your, in, if you can start wearing your heavenly eyes. We're going to see if you can receive the kingdom of God. And for the rest of you, It's homework time. Got your homework assignment. <laughs> the homework. Boy, that was not the kind of high school I ever went to. <laughs> it was. So you have two homework assignments. One's, one is for you and one is for somebody else. Now, I'm also going to invite the worship team to come up because we're going to wrap it up here. I want you to ask a skeptic, somebody you know who is not a Christian, or maybe they're a Christian or they're like, they're kind of dabbling, they're like one of these like fair weather Christians, you know, they come to church on Christmas and Easter, or they're not really sold out for the kingdom, or maybe they don't even understand the kingdom, right? Find one of these people, you know, you already have somebody in your mind, find them, send them this message. It should be up on podcast within a day or so. You could send it to them. You could give it to them on YouTube or on Facebook. Send it to them, but, but have them listen to it and then go and have a conversation with them about it. Now, I don't want you to, listen, this is not, I'm going to get my notch on a belt and I'm going to you know, check something off and I'm going to get somebody saved. This is not what I'm talking about. Like, that's great if that happens. I just want you to go talk to somebody about the gospel. 
about this message, about the kingdom of God, about recognizing their need for a savior, about the good life, just go and have a conversation. 15, 20 minutes. This doesn't, you don't need to complicate things. Listen, I, I, I really don't believe the scripture wants us to complicate things. You just send it to somebody and say, hey, can I come over and talk to you about this tomorrow? When you listen to it, they say, yes. Can I come talk to you about it tomorrow? Not a big deal. I'm not trying to push Christianity on you, get you to come to my church. None of that. I just want to come have a conversation with you about it. What do you think about it? What do you think about this idea that with this upside down kingdom that Jesus is talking about? About what it really means to be wealthy. What do you guys think about that? Just have a conversation. For the rest of you, or for the, not the rest of you, but for you individually, your homework assignment is to read the next series of verses. We have verse 21 and verse 25. Okay? Now these are they're paired verses, remember? So Jesus is saying, blessed are these people and woe to these people. So it's a paired verse. 21 and 25, and I want you to ask yourself some questions. First of all, what does it mean to be hungry? And I'll give you a hint. He's not talking about when the pastor talks too long on Sunday. What does it mean to be hungry? Use your spiritual lens. This is the, this is the exercise that Jesus has been t- teaching us through, through the scriptures for the last couple months. Use your spiritual lens. What does it to mean? What does it mean to be hungry spiritually versus hungry in the world? And then what does it mean to be satisfied? And tie it all in together with this word Ashray and Baruch. Okay, we have the, the good life belongs to these people, and here's the blessing. And I want you to see what the Holy Spirit reveals to you. And then, and then come ready next, next week, and, and uh, we'll, see if, we'll see if we're on the same page. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Spirit leader. 
presence of my Savior. Spirit is um, just doing something right now. I, I just got a picture of Jesus. He's walking in here and he has these like seeds of faith. There's like this burning, it's it's like little balls of fire. It's like a I can't I can't put it into words. It's it, it's like when we have that seed of faith. I said if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed. Well, I just praise you, Jesus. I just pray, pray that we would receive what you have for us. Just put those seeds of faith in us, Lord Jesus, and let it grow, Father. Jesus, we just receive that faith, the faith that can move a mountain, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. Just pray for encouragement for everybody here right now that needs to needs to have that you said you provide all of our needs even the faith you provide that too provide the seeds of faith Steve. 
trust you, Lord. You are my perfect love, it casts out fear. Perfect love, it casts out fear. Jesus, when you hear this, Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord. Let's take away all fear, God. And replace it with those seeds of faith that I saw, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm 
their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing, you are worthy of it all, you are worthy of it all, for from you are all things, and to Since I ride you, I 
you want prayer, we'd love to pray with you. If there's a mother in your life that you'd like to pray with, I would encourage you to do that. Just put your hand on, on her shoulder if she's nearby. Just offer a prayer of gratitude and thanks. I know this isn't, you know, it's it, it's such a joyous time if you've had a, an amazing, wonderful mom, but I know that it's challenging for others. So if you want prayer for anything, we'd love to pray with you. Um, and uh, I think that one of the greatest things that you can offer your mother from the kingdom is, is a prayer, like with her. So I'd encourage you to do that. Just step out of your comfort zone. Gather around your mom if she's here. Maybe call her later on the phone if she's not here and just offer her a moment of prayer. So let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for, for family. We're grateful for this beautiful plan that you created for us, Lord. We're grateful for our moms. us as kids to know what to say and how to say it, to thank them, and help the mothers to be able to receive the love that the kids have to offer. <laughs> Lord, I pray blessings over everyone here as we go about our lives and our families. Help us to fully embrace your biblical model of what it means to be a family. Jesus' name. Amen. If you want prayer, come on up. We'd love to pray for you. Have a good week.